Hello, everyone, and welcome to this RadioTimes.com Q&A to celebrate the release of the final book in the Last Kingdom series, Warlord. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by two wonderful guests today, Bernard Cornwell, the author of the Last Kingdom series, and Alexander Draymond, the star of the Last Kingdom Netflix show. Uh, thank you both very much for joining me today. Thank you, David. Hi, David. Um, Thank you. Great. So um, to start off with, um, we'll just say that the book is available now. And if you would like to purchase a copy, do head over to radiotimes.com slash warlord to find out exactly how. Um, and to start off with, let's begin with the first page, because, of course, this book is actually dedicated to Alexander Draymond. Uh, and I'm wondering, Bernard, it's a very nice gesture. And, and can you tell us you know, what was what was behind the decision to do that? Well, it was a way of really thanking the whole film crew. And Alexander has to stand in for all his colleagues and uh, scores and scores of people who add so much value to the book. And I've also got very fond of Alexander over the last few years, even though when I was invited to have a cameo in the show, he murdered me, which was, I think, <laughs> rank gratitude, really. Uhtred murdered you. <laughs> Um, can, can I just jump in here, Bernard, because I'm, I'm genuinely getting a little bit emotional because I've, I've only just found out about this and, and I, haven't, I haven't spoken to Bernard yet. I, I found out yesterday because uh, everybody you know, from the cast sent me notes about it and I'm so over the moon about it. I'm so, so grateful to you, Bernard. And um, first of all, I love that your dedication says um, that uh, the, the Warlord is dedicated to Alexander Draymond and he must stand for all the extraordinary actors and producers and directors and writers and technicians who have flattered these novels with their talents. And that's really true. We, we have an extraordinary crew and an extraordinary cast um, and an extraordinary production team. and. Uh, and the fact that you did, dedicated your last book to us means the world. I remember after shooting the first season, um, the only moment that I truly got nervous was when Bernard watched the first episode. And um, I was standing in the back of the room and I was, I was literally shaking with anxiety and, and then you know, you came up to me and you're very complimentary and that meant the world. And this is just, I'm so grateful. That's it. That's all I want to say. You're very welcome, Alexander. And of course, this is a very momentous occasion because it is the 13th and final book in the Last Kingdom series. So I'm just wondering, um, without giving away any spoilers, of course, Bernard, could you give us an introduction to where this installment picks up for England and also where Uhtred is at this stage in his life? Well, this installment happens in the year 937 AD. Um, and it's getting very near towards the end of Uhtred's life. He's lived far too long, to be honest. Um, but most historical novels have a big story and a little story. And the big story is often the true history. Um, if you think of Gone with the Wind, it's the Civil War. The little story is Can Scarlet Save Tara? Well, the Uhtred series is much the same. The big story is the creation of England. The little story is Uhtred's part in that. And where we are now is the moment when, if you like, England suddenly comes into being. Um, it happens at a place called Brunenburg. And there was a battle there in 937 AD. So I always knew that the whole series would lead up to this battle because you could very loosely say that on the morning of Brunenburg, there was no country called England. And as the sun set on that ghastly field, there was. So it's towards the end of Uhtred's life and the very beginning of England. And was this a finale uh, to the series that you had envisioned from the beginning when you were writing the first book? Or is this something that kind of took shape as the series progressed? No, I, I think I always knew I wanted to end at the Battle of Brunenburg. It's about the only thing I knew about any of the books before I began writing them. Um, because it is such a crucial turning point in history. Um, so, in a sense, all 13 books lead up to the end of, end of this one. And 
Another thing that really struck me about the book is that although it is the final book in the series, um, and obviously so much, so many stories have come before it, I also feel that it's very accessible. Um, and if it were to be your kind of first entry into The Last Kingdom, you could follow it with relative ease. And I'm wondering, is that something that you consciously think about when you're writing these books, trying to kind of keep them open and accessible? Well, I don't think I consciously think about it, but obviously if you're writing a series, and I wrote a very long series about Sharp and then 13 and this one, you do want each book, as it were, to stand alone. You don't want readers to suddenly feel lost, a whole lot of information that makes no sense. Um, so you do spend a little bit of time at the beginning of each book with a kind of introducing people to characters which they already know if they've read the other books, but a new reader wouldn't know who they are. So yeah, I guess it's conscious. Um, well, as, as we previously mentioned, uh, the book is available now uh, and you can head over to radiotimes.com slash warlord to find out exactly how to get it. Um, and for you, Alex, um, how familiar were you with these books when you first became involved in the Last Kingdom television series? The casting process for Uhtred was very long because a lot of people had to okay um, who was going to play Uhtred. And so... I think my, I sent in my first self-tape for it in April 2014, and I, uh, I got word that I got the part, I think it was September uh, 2014. And so when I, uh, when I sent the first self-tape, I, I didn't know about it. And by the time I sent the second self-tape, I already had read the, the first book because I, I got genuinely interested and without really knowing whether this was going to be part of my life or not, I, I started reading because I, I just loved them. So by the time, by the time it was my job to bring Utra to life, I, I had read most of the, most of the books. And for an actor, that is such a, a um, luxury because I love the research part uh, to create a character, but, Sometimes it's quite difficult to to find the right information for whatever you're you're endeavoring to play, and this was Bernard handing me all of it on a silver platter. So I had everything I needed to to prep for Utrecht. And it's funny because now, like reading The Last Kingdom, Warlord. I can't help but when I'm reading kind of Uhtred's dialogue and Uhtred's monologue, I kind of hear it in your voice, Alex, because obviously you're just so kind of synonymous with the role now. Um, I'm wondering, Bernard, um, why do you think that Alex is such like a natural fit for this role? I'm very tempted to say it's because he looks so like me. But I don't think he'd agree. Um, I'm not... working on it. <laughs> I'll get there. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, from the very first moment I saw Alexander as Uhtred, I thought, yeah, they've got the right guy. Um, he looks right, he sounds right, he is right. And I just leave it at that. Uh, and like you, when I'm now writing Uhtred, I hear Alexander's voice um, very strongly. If that's not a compliment. It is a compliment, Alexander. <laughs> Um, and were you particularly involved in kind of the early development stages of the television series, Bernard, um, and the casting process? Not in the least. I had absolutely nothing to do with it. I think I received a very vague offer to be maybe what they call a technical advisor, and I said no. I used to work in television a long time ago, and the one thing I learned about that experience is that I know nothing whatsoever about making television drama. And I thought that any involvement that I had would probably end up being an obstacle. Um, and it was best simply to let them get on with it. I mean, these are the wonderful people who made Downton Abbey. What they don't know about making television drama, well, they know it all. So I was very, very happy to leave it all. Um, and I've never cast anything. I wouldn't have any, any advice about casting. Um, and I really think it's best, for me anyway, maybe for not every writer, just to stay out of it and let them get on with it, because they're going to bring so much to it. Um, and I think that my job is to be a cheerleader and occasionally to die at the hands of my hero.
And you, you mentioned a moment ago, Alex, about how, um, you know, one of your most nerve wracking days on set in season one uh, was when Bernard was there kind of seeing the performance. Was that the first time you'd met or did you, were you able to meet at all prior to filming to discuss the character? It, no, it was, it was the screening after everything had been shot. Right, right. And was, so, that, was that the first time you'd, you'd met each other? Yeah, that's the first time we met, right? Yes, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I see. Well, then I guess it is a great thing that you were able to sort of digest those books and really kind of get to know the character. Yeah. And thank God I didn't mess it up too much. <laughs> you didn't mess it up at all, Alexander. Um, and, and now that you know where Uhtred's story is heading uh, with this 13th book, um, do you think that will inform your performance at all in the upcoming season five of The Last Kingdom? You know, in since we're doing a television series, we can never stick exactly to the books, which is which is why sometimes you know sometimes I, I read the two books that we're putting in the season just to um, to refresh my memory on it, and and there have been seasons where I actually regretted that I've done that because there are so many moments in the books that I get genuinely excited about. And then when it gets to shooting, we can't include those moments for many different reasons. Certainly not for lack of will. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been disappointed in the past and, and it's always, it's always tough to, to have to make these concessions when, uh, when it gets to the script. But on the other hand, I think what's wonderful is that we almost get, another story out of it, um, which up until now, Bernard has, has always been very supportive of. And, uh, and so I, I, just, I just fully get behind what's in the script. Um, that doesn't completely answer your question. I think when I, when I map out my character arc, I map it, I map it out according to the scripts and not according to the books, because otherwise I'd, I'd not be telling exactly the same story. Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes total sense. And um, I'm wondering, because for me, reading through Warlord, the you do notice the differences in character from Uhtred in the series, the the Netflix series, and Uhtred in the books. But for me, reading Warlord, I I feel like Uhtred has kind of he's a bit of a colder, a bit of a more cynical uh, character. Um, but perhaps a bit more embittered than the Uhtred that we see in the Netflix series. I'm wondering, uh, Bernard, how has the character evolved and changed uh, in over the course of your novels? I wish I could tell you, but I never think too much about that. He's got a lot older, and like all of us who are old, I hope he's got wiser. And he has a great deal more experience. Um, I mean, I don't really see Alexander when I write them because the Uhtred I'm writing is about my age, which is in his mid-70s. Um, and Alexander Damon is young. Um, so when I think of Alexander as Uhtred, I have to add a gray beard and deep lines. And <laughs> well, we're faced with that problem now, getting into season five, where Uhtred is technically, I think he starts at 54 and ends up at 60 in the books. I couldn't remember. <laughs> I think it's, I, 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 map, uh, I, I mapped it out um, once with, uh, with the help of, uh, of a friend of mine called Wendy. And, uh, and she, um, she put a whole timeline together for me. And, Get to send it to um, me. Sorry? Get her to send it to me. <laughs> I will. I will. I've got it. So, yeah, in season five, he's supposed to start at 54, I think, and ends up at 60. And, uh, you know, that's a problem right now because how, how do we, you know, how do we make it look like Uhtred is aged without it looking comical? Oh, you're I'm working on it. Yeah, well, it's, it's really funny you should say that because that was going to be one of my questions. I mean, I'm sure, you know, there are some, maybe some makeup, hair dye kind of tricks perhaps to be done, but it, I can understand that must be quite a challenge. Yeah. Um, one of the really interesting things about The Last Kingdom is that, of course, although it is a work of fiction, it does, it's set against that real historical backdrop um, of early British history. 
And uh, so, Bernard, what is the writing process uh, behind one of these books and just how much research is required before you can start kind of tackling the story? Well, I think um, it is a lifelong project. And I began reading about the Saxons 50 odd years ago, long before I became a writer. And I became interested. So by the time I decided I wanted to write about them, I already had a huge amount of background information. And then for each book, you look at whatever is available. I mean, starting with the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and with whatever other chronicles. And of course, you read what the real historians say about it. And you hope that out of that reading, a story idea will emerge. But I'm absolutely hopeless at planning a book. Um, I've never been able to do it. So what I tend to do is I tend to start off the first chapter by throwing Uhtred into some kind of a problem and seeing how he gets out of it which he always does. Um, and then it just goes on from there. And it's not a very efficient way to write a book. I often think of it as like climbing a mountain and you get a third of the way up and you turn back and you see a better route. And then the only thing you can do is go back and take that route. So you rewrite the first third and that propels you halfway up and then you look back and see another route. Um, so it's a slow process. Uh, but truly the enjoyment is that when I'm writing a book, I discover what happens, which is the same joy as reading a book. You know, the joy of reading a story is to find out what happens. And for me, that's the joy of writing. It's the only way I know to find out what happens. Hmm. There's a little difference in Warlord because I knew that the Battle of Brunenberg had to be at the end of it. So at least I had a goal. Hmm. And is there, obviously, you're, you're a real kind of authority on this period in history. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, what is it that draws you to this particular kind of era? Um, and has there been a, a specific event that you found really most interesting kind of diving into? Well, I think what drew me to it is the mystery about England's creation. Um, I mean, I think I had a very good education in England, with good history teachers. Um, and yet I was never really taught about how England came into being. You know, we sing there'll always be in England, and the implication is there always was. Well, there was, uh, when King Alfred died in 899, there wasn't an England. Um, and then, what, 38 years later, there was. And that's a story that's really worth telling. Um, and Brunenberg is, if you like, the foundation event of the creation of England, and it's a very grim, and horrible event in the sense that it's a slaughterous battle. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle said, never was there such slaughter in this island. And yet we forgot all about it, as if the history was taken over by the people who insist it begins in 1066. And I think it is worth knowing where a country comes from. It was a period when the whole of Britain, if you like, was being remade, not just by, in this case, King Athelstan, but Constantine in Scotland and Hulda in Wales. So it's a fascinating period. And Alex, in, in a way, you've been kind of immersed in this period of history, um, in a way kind of unlike anybody else. Um, ha has there been any, any incidents that like have really piqued your interest when you've been filming the series? Have you been encouraged to kind of explore further? You know, I think the thing that strikes me the most when we shoot the series is when we shoot in winter, and when we experience the elements, because what makes the show look so real is that a lot of it is real. When we're miserable and cold, we literally, when we're supposed to look like that, we literally are miserable and cold. And um, and even though we have long shooting days, um, at the end of the day, we can go back to our apartments and take a hot shower. And back in the day, you couldn't. And that is... I mean, I, I many times I just I just wonder how we've made it this far. How have we survived all these years of miserable cold? I think most people in today's world would die of of a flu or of a cold, you know, within the first year. I think that's what what strikes me the most, and and the luxury of of um, I don't think many people have the luxury of really living in those circumstances. Um, historical circumstances for an extended amount of time like that. Yes, yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely unimaginable. I mean, I think about how 
bad my mood gets when the Wi-Fi cuts out for five minutes and <laughs> things were so much worse back then. Um, and of course, the, these are historical novels, but something really interesting is that in both the Netflix series and the novels, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we have seen kind of sorcerers and characters that kind of seem to have maybe some supernatural ability or perhaps not, it's kind of left open. And I, I'm wondering, Bernard, where do you draw the line when you're writing these? At, at what point do you would you say they it's too fantasy? Because obviously you you do want to keep these kind of grounded. In turn, <laughs> on what character and stuff believes. I mean, Utra does believe that there are gods, and he believes that some people have a unique relationship with those gods. He believes that some people can see into the future. Uh, we don't believe that, at least most of us don't, and the reader probably doesn't believe it, but I have to make the reader believe that Uhtred believes it. Um, and when a sorcerer comes along who is particularly powerful, Uhtred is going to be very frightened. And they did believe that. I mean, I think that's obvious because we're talking about a pre-scientific, pre-technological age, and the only answer to some of the biggest questions of life, which is, you know, why did the harvest fail? Why did my child die? The only answer is a supernatural answer. Um, so they believe in their gods or for the Christians in their God. And they believe that some people have a particular and peculiar relationship with those gods. Um, and that's a comfort to them. And the reader has to believe in their belief. Uh, so I think that's the line. The line is, no, I don't think that the sorcerer skull could really see the future. Um, but I think that everybody around him believed he could. And in fact, I mean, one of Uhtred's wives, and I'm very generous to Alexandra, I give him a lot, um, cast the rune sticks and she makes a, a prophecy, which in the end doesn't actually come true because I'm sure that most of those prophecies didn't come true. But the prophecy gives Uhtred a lot of comfort through the next few years of his life. So I think you just, it's, it's simply that, that you, it is what the characters themselves would believe that matters. And it's interesting though that you mention one of Uhtred's wives, because Uhtred has had a, a number of kind of romantic partners over the course of his life. Um, and, and unfortunately for a lot of them, it hasn't ended very well. And I, I'm wondering, did you ever consider giving Uhtred kind of a, a sort of happily ever after, um, you know, settling down with someone for the long term? Or did you always want to keep things kind of emotionally very tough for him? Um, I wanted to keep tough for him, but very good to him. In the last two books, he finds somebody, and this isn't a spoiler, I don't think. He's still with her at the end of the 13th book, so there's your happy ever after. Well, it's, it's good to see. It's good to see some, some good things going on for Uhtred. We like to see it. And of course, The Last Kingdom fans wouldn't be very happy with me if I didn't ask about season five at all, because obviously we got the wonderful news that the show has been renewed. That was over the summer. Um, so obviously everything's very uncertain at the moment. Uh, but I'm wondering, Alex, do you have any indication at the moment of when you might start filming on, on the next series? Um, we're going to start shooting uh, towards the end of this year under very strict COVID-19 guidelines, of course. Well, that's very exciting. That's sooner than I think um, a lot of people would expect, but that's, that's very good news. Um, yeah, we're very lucky to be able to, to work at the moment. And, and the Netflix series is a very broadly uh, faithful translation of the books. But of course, there have been a few changes, um, as we touched upon earlier, um, while kind of adapting the stories. Um, and I'm wondering, Bernard, are there any moments from the earlier books uh, that didn't make it into the show that you would have liked to have seen? Oh, Lord, I really can't remember. I mean, I've loved the show, all of them. And I get slightly irritated with people who complain that the they're not exactly the same story as the books. Uh, because filmmakers have totally different constraints from, I have no constraints. I mean, if I think I need 30,000 Vikings to come hammering against Uhtred, I can just make them up. It doesn't cost me anything. I can't, you know, I can just do it. So yeah, they have constraints I don't have. And 
I think the thing that when we've been watching, Judy and I have been watching the series, the thing I've said most often to her is how clever the writers have been in adapting the books, um, keeping certain key scenes in or key threads in, um, and moving other things around. And I think it works enormously well. And I have no patience with people who say, well, it didn't follow the book exactly. Um, you know, you're getting something extra, more story. Um, so I can't think of anything. I mean, I'd have to go back and read them, which I've never done. So. <laughs> Fair enough. That's that's uh, well, yeah. It's a very good point, and um, and I think one of the things that people love about the the series is just how kind of fast paced it is. It really keeps people on their toes, um, and of course. Alex is not the only person in this Q&A to have started an episode of The Last Kingdom, uh, because as, as you mentioned earlier, you did have that very memorable cameo in season three. Um, can you take us back to how that came about? Well, the producers very kindly asked me if I wanted to have a cameo appearance. And, you know, vanity being what it is, I said yes. Um, but you know, you know why that happened, though? I have no idea, Alexander. Because because you told me that you were uh, you were working as an actor during the summers that you were doing theater. Well, that's true. I was. Yeah. So this this was a good opportunity to put those acting skills to use. Then. <laughs> I think I had one line. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> I also had hair extensions down to my waist. <laughs> Do you have any kind of standout memories from that day? I mean, obviously, Alex, you mentioned a moment ago about how, you know, shooting can be quite cold. It looked like it was quite cold in that scene that you shared together um, in the woods. Do you have any kind of standout memories from shooting that day? It was fake snow. It, <laughs> it, was, a, it was a pickup scene, actually. Well, not a pickup scene, but we, we had shot part of that scene earlier in the year when it was truly cold. And then that part of the scene we shot, I think it was April. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, uh, they put fake snow over a huge part of the forest and yeah, it looked very real, <laughs> but it wasn't cold anymore. Oh, well, you know, that's that's a bonus there. I mean, it looked very real to me watching. <laughs> I didn't question it for a moment. Um, and of course, you know, this must be quite an emotional thing for you, Bernard, saying goodbye to the character, closing the book on him, literally, in a sense. Um, how does that feel, kind of saying goodbye to The Last Kingdom? Oh, there's certainly some sadness because I've lived with Uhtred for the last 15 years. And when you write a book, you t it tends to haunt you. Um, you know, you take the dog for a walk and what you're thinking about is Uhtred. Um, and suddenly that's all gone. It's just all completely gone. And so, yeah, I do. I, I like Uhtred and I regret it. And, um, but I don't think I'll ever go back to him. And I suppose it had to happen in a sense, um, you know, as you mentioned, the story is about England kind of coming together. Um, and that's kind of what we start to see with that final battle that we were talking about. So, Right. I mean, um, the story is over uh, with the creation of England. Um, and I leave it open ended. You know that he's going back to Bevenberg with his lady. Um, and the rest is in your imagination as much as it's in mine. And as now as a complete series of novels, uh, what do you hope that readers take away from The Last Kingdom? Entertainment. Um, I mean, my job is to tell stories. Uh, and if people enjoy the stories, then I've succeeded. Uh, and I'd also hope that they will have a greater awareness of their own history, although that's really not terribly important. I mean, I think if you read the whole series, you're bound to understand a great deal more about how this or that England became a country. Um, but above all, I'd like to think it entertained people. And Alex, in a sense, with the Last Kingdom novels now wrapped up and completed, uh, but the Netflix series still very much ongoing, you're kind of taking uh, Uhtred and The Last Kingdom into the future. And do you feel some responsibility in that role? Well, definitely. Uh, but I think one of the, one of the, the 
many advantages that the Saxon series has is that the books that Bernard wrote are timeless. And I don't think that we necessarily need my or Netflix's involvement in order to keep the, the Saxon series in the, on people's minds. I think people are going to pick those books up in the future for many, many years to come. Definitely. Well, as we previously mentioned, the book is available now. Uh, do head over to radiotimes.com slash warlord if you would like to pick up a copy. Um, and I think that brings to an end this Q&A. So I'd just like to say again, a huge thank you to uh, author Bernard Cornwell and The Last Kingdom star Alexander Draymond for joining us today. Do keep your eyes peeled on radiotimes.com for future events. And thank you again very much for watching.